Pueblo Native American, and I'm a professor at the University of Washington, I teach art. And I also teach the graphic imagery of this, what we call the typical style of the Northwest Coast art, is encompasses the areas above Vancouver Island to up to the northern part of Alaska. And this is a kind of a, a, a visual language that we're looking at in terms of the patterns and the and the uh, the images and the shapes and forms that we have is very traditional to this area as well as farther north, and so it creates a puzzle that we can identify with different family crests. That was essentially how they all began. So it's kind of like a, you can think of it very much like a family coat of arms, like the Europeans would have banners. We would put our, our designs on boxes and bowls mm -hmm. and such, but taking that idea, and this is not a, this is not a new uh, art form. It's, prints have been done, you know, 50 years ago, if not longer, they were uh, printmakers. But taking the image and applying it to prints is just another means of, of uh, you know, or sharing that, mention of sharing the, the art. And I think that's one thing to look at. Why is it so, uh, Northwest Coast art so, uh, uh, there's, there's a lot of it. You see a lot of, you know, imagery, a lot of, of the shapes and forms and designs is essentially, traditionally, it was a way of portraying and sharing their crest with with everyone. Mm -hmm. It's it's really kind of an honor and and word maybe pride in being a bear, raven, wolf, and so on. And so putting that on everything was really uh, uh, a way of sharing their family, their crest, their their their. their uh, and now I take that that concept of I'm a, a a sculptor in many different forms, and yet this is one way I can share my artwork with with people is through prints. Correct. You can you can cover you know a vast That's area right. in, in a fairly reasonable way. I had and, a couple of questions regarding your prints. Yeah. Number one is I've noticed on most of them you uh, print up 449. Is that significant? Uh, 395 to 449, 450. Okay. Uh, yeah. Is that uh, just a reason? In. No. 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 Just just, just a and, number. Uh, these are serographs. These are serographs or silk screens. Okay. And so I print I print each and every one of my prints myself. Excellent. Uh, and what I do all my separations. And are you using an embossed print? To I, all my prints are embossed. There's one that it's not that embossed, but I'm typically noted for my embossing. The dyes are either hand cut in brass, or they are etched, uh, acid etched embossed uh, dyes, which I'll show you. But I'm also noted for for embossing the prints. And uh, I like. I'm really a, a kind of a. I'm motivated by experimentation. I like to 
in my work, I, I tend to look at myself, although I've been doing the artwork for some time, <clears throat> I'm really keen on experimenting and, 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 and uh, uh, looking at new ways to, to approach the art. And I think that's not, <clears throat> you may look at me as a contemporary artist, but if you look at historically, at traditional art, mm -hmm. it was very innovative and very creative back 200 years ago. And it was, it was a way of, of, there's something not only the sense of identifying the, the, in, the, the family crest or the, the design, but it's also how unique and how, how you can really uh, awe your audience, your audience, with, with producing a work of art. And it was, they had a very keen sense of what we call like boasting, pride. Mm -hmm. There was a sense of, look at this, right. look what I right. did. And if you look at pieces in museums, the mountain hoard and the mountain sheep bowls and things of that nature, incredible work that was done 200 years ago. And they did that for the purpose of wowing their audience and look, at, look what I did and look how yes. much work I put into this. And they go, wow, that's good. Mm -hmm. You really are proud of what you're right. doing. And, right. we do, and we tend to do the same thing. But I like to say, well, now what can I do with this design or this, this approach to Northwest Coast Art? How can I kind of push it and keep pushing it and Correct. looking at different? And that's what brings in a lot of the other materials. But this being a very traditional design, which is the red, black, <clears throat> and blue color, is to take this and take it a little bit further, and that's like taking into more color. And this is just accentuating how do you want to do clouds? Well, it's really, when you start looking at, uh, this is the raven and the moon putting it up into the heavens with the eagle in the background. This did, became a little more elaborate, elaborated in the sense that well, how do you do clouds, or how do you, how are you going to put that up in there, with with using reds, blues, and 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 the traditional colors? But yet you go, well, gee, maybe they don't have to be red, blue, and black. They could be uh, different shades of blue, and throwing some green and showing some hi highlights of the sun or the moon, right? And bringing that into a a different kind of theme, and it allows you to expand your 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 uh, your theme or your and your also design, your palette as well your palette right. exactly right. so we we do I do tend to take that in a sense of a, a, a that challenge of of how I could incorporate and not be uh, essentially uh, uh, just reserving it to some of the traditional colors but then I go back to the say how do I validate that well you look at some of the early Eden shop pieces they do the same thing mm -hmm. but you look at some of the uh, early prints of uh, Henry Speck back in the, on Vancouver Island, they used a lot of yellows and greens. Correct. And those were done in the 30s, see, yes. and the 20s, see. Yes. So it's not it's not a new new thing. Um, but I take something like this, and I'll go back, and I'll take now I I, I experimented in glass, and here's another uh, wonderful piece here that you know we've we've done in glass, and. This is not unlike the print. It's just another medium. You Correct. Know, using color, uh, I didn't want to hold to just the red and the and the uh, blue and, and black, where I could bring in multiple colors because we have we have accessible of multiple colors of glass that are fusible. So why not use those? Correct. And uh, although this wasn't the the idea of monumental or larger pieces, it's just the amount of of how far I can push the, the material, uh, and it's just the amount of uh, how so, how what the size of the kiln I have access to. I was going to ask that. My thing to a certain degree. Well, then, but we can do multiples of these, and then at the, the children's hospital would be, like I said, 26 feet high, a long, correct, 18 feet high. So we can expand it. Which is this piece over here, is the model for the children's hospital, and this is just taking it, looking at a two-dimensional essentially a two-dimensional form in the large northwest, which we call the Northwest Kachina, because it has the, that face, but taking it into more of a three-dimensional object here. Correct. In the sense, for the trailer, we made it into a puzzle, which is juxtaposition parts mm -hmm. of the mother whale here and the, and the child and the little, little, little one here coming through. But um, this is a piece that we'll be completing in December 2005. But it, I've done... Uh, 
a number of public works. Uh, we've done, I think, 40 buildings, and we're still doing a couple other things. But it's, that's a challenge in the sense that, I, that how would you approach that particular project? Or, you know, what are they looking for, and how can I enhance that building or uh, and bring in something that's uh, uh, really uh, different than usual, and yet still uh, now this particular my piece is going to be suspended. This is suspended from the ceiling. We're building an atrium. They're building an atrium at the hospital. It's a glass atrium with a steel frame, and they'll sus suspend it from the ceiling. It'll hang down, but there's certain wall uh, floors that you. I think there's four floors, three or four floors. So you'll see the whale down below here, and you'll see it right across here. There's another floor here that get, it's a balcony. And then there's one up here, you'll see it again. So you get to view it from different different angles. And well, as you walk into the hospital this way, it greets you as you come in. So it'll be a really nice nice uh, addition to the new hospital. And the uh, black areas, is that going to be steel? This will be steel. The black areas will be uh, laser cut steel in several sections. And we'll sandwich or put the pieces together, which will capture the glass plates. And the glass plates will be uh, the same same process of cutting and fusing the glass together, and then we'll safety glass it, uh, uh, the pieces so they'll, they'll, they'll that And how many layers of glass are you going to use? We have five layers. It's a half inch thick, okay. and we have uh, actually four layers plus a, uh, a piece of safety glass on the back. Okay. Uh huh. And uh, do you do all the fusing yourself? We do all the well. We do all the cutting ourselves. We have our, I have my own water jet machine, but the fusing is done in Milwaukee, uh, Oregon, which is just right across, or near Portland, Oregon, which we have our, we work with uh, Studio Ramp in, in uh, near Portland that does all our fusing because they have larger fusing tables than we could accommodate in our studio at this time. Okay. And we've been working with them uh, for several years in doing all the other fused pieces, and so we're comfortable working with them. Excellent. And. The normal process, do you make the uh, steel frame first and then fit the pieces inside? Yeah, well, you know, it's not really, it doesn't really, the process is really, uh, you can look at it as a step-by-step -step process, but we computerize everything as one piece incorporating the steel and the glass, and then we digitize that, uh, and so we can, we're cutting steel now. Okay. We're cutting the glass at the same time, but as it's being assembled, we assemble the steel onto a, 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 a like a, a, a frame, a wooden frame. We'll put the steel on, and then we'll put a piece of glass, but the steel will hold that in place, and then we'll, and then we'll put the other piece over it. In the, fusing, it. In the fusing process, does the glass ever change as give? Uh, no, it doesn't shrink or swell or anything of that nature, no. No, it's very stable. And then. Inside the glass, we have rubber grommets or rubber uh, areas that, that will hold the, the glass from touching the steel. Oh, very good. good. That'll keep it. Uh, but there's it's it's five sheets of of, gla of, of steel, but it, it'll it, it's very rigid, so there's no no oh, movement in that in that respect. Do you have a prince working with you on this project? I don't. I don't have. Oh, let me see. Do I? I'm trying to think. Through. I don't for this project, but I've used several st students at the university uh, as apprentice and work study or mm -hmm. art students that I've used in the past. One of the wonderful pieces that we did for, uh, that is uh, well noted in uh, uh, in my work for public art is that we just recently finished. What's well, been a few years ago, we did uh, the. Uh, National Museum for Wildlife Art on Jackson Hole. Oh, that's wonderful. And it's a large pole. Oh, yes. The pole? Yes. That's my pole. Oh. I used uh, three or four students on that. Excellent. And so they, they were involved in that. So I try to involve the students as much as possible Excellent. in this project. This one really doesn't a acquire a lot of, of, you know, apprentice in the sense it's all really done computerized and then all that's put on a on a disc and then the machines do all the cutting, essentially much more mechanical in that respect. Do you have to work with the architect for uh, its suspension? Oh yeah, we work with engineers out of Texas uh, that do the, have to do the suspension, take in the weight load, also the earthquake 
So it's earthquake proof in the sense that it's sta that's stable during an earthquake. And uh, so that's all taken into account, the weight and the size. And of course, working with the hospital, so the hospital <laughs> yes. is happy. That's too. very important. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, you were talking uh, earlier about doing these uh, cast faces. faces. Correct. And uh, can you explain a little bit about the, the procedure of making yeah, one of those? Yeah, the procedure of making this face is uh, that I will carve this out of wood. Now, actually, if I have the little face here, maybe if I can do this one. This one here you can see. Uh, you can imagine this being cut. Actually, this is the face that if you can imagine this being in wood. Okay. So I carved this out of wood at this size here. So this is 100%. And, and then we, we took this and we scanned this and we created a graphite mold. So you imagine you flip it this way. So we got a large graphite mold. So we could pour hot glass, castable glass into the mold. And once it cools, it has to be nailed for several days. Then we can pop it out. We pop it out and then we put it to a healing. Okay, so we can take it out of the mold quite as it, it'll, it'll, uh, it'll, it'll harden up a little bit where you can take it out of the mold. Right. Now we'll take this, this piece here, once it's scanned in the computer, we can make it larger. So you're taking, this is an exact copy of this one here. Correct. So we just enlarge this on our, on our computer, and then we cut a larger graphite mold for this, and then we poured it in there. So we Excellent. can make it as large as, as we could make the graphite mold. Okay. So we're only limited in the size. But uh, this one here, 17 inches, and this would be the one with the corona or whatever we'll be placing into the large whale. But essentially, we'll always start off either carving it out of wood. And what type of wood do you use? We use basswood. Okay. Basswood's a great wood because it doesn't have much grain to it. You can carve either direction. But masks traditionally are carved out of either alder or large cedar, or cedar ones, alder, some maple masks, but for making molds, we use uh, we use basswood. I like basswood right. a lot. A lot of the it's manufacturers nice, of It's a nice wood. Automotives who make uh, basswood. Oh, really? Yes. Well, I learned using basswood by just by um, a gentleman that carved duck decoys, the real, or, d right. or birds. Right. And they carved everything out of basswood because it has such fine detail. Oh yes, I've seen them. And they're just incredible. Right. I mean, it's just, I'm talking the realistic ones. Exactly. And I go, what are you kind of? Oh, we use basswood. I says, man, I'm gonna get some of that basswood. <laughs> so we take the basswood. But taking this even further, we've uh, glass has always intrigued me, and this is where the pots came in and doing. This is a clam basket. A clam basket in the sense that. Traditionally, the baskets would have these roped uh, 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 fibers so that the water would rush out of the basket as it was being used to gather clams. But it's taking a utilitarian or the idea of a basket and creating it into glass. And, and traditionally, glass was used for vessels and pots and bowls, but taking it into another, another material. And what's the procedure of making one of these uh, vessels? This is this is done with this has a couple couple different here's the other one over here which is quite quite nice. It's, this one here is has you can show you a little more detail. Is that we create the basket by doing a couple things, which is a little bit unusual to most glass blowers, is that uh, we'll I use a red red core here, but then we, if you notice that you see the basket patterns in, Correct. The, in here, and that's all dusted onto a steel plate. And we roll this and pick up the dusting, which gives us the basket pattern in the background. Beautiful. And you can see the different patterns. And, and, and then we take these ravens are actually water jet out of compatible glass that we actually make beforehand, and we cut these out individually. So we keep these into a... Um, we call it a garage, actually, and it's a, it's heated up to 400 degrees, and we can take that out with these, with with uh, uh, these uh, like pliers, and we can lay that right on the glass, and you can imagine being laid like this, and we can roll that, and we can pick up all those ravens, and so it's really a, 
it's a technique of applique that I've kind of perfected and been using with glass. It's gorgeous. And people have not really been doing this yet. You see a lot of applique, you see applique, but not using the water jet machine. Right. And then applying them in this fashion. But we can do a lot of different things with the machine and creating different images like yeah, what that. What type of uh, chemistries are you using to create this uh, basket it's pattern? The, the basket patterns that we use, actually what I do here, because they are, as you notice, you can see quite pronounced uh, uh, shapes and forms of the patterns, is that what I do is I'll take and digitize the basket pattern and cut a steel template, aluminum or steel template that we lay down and then we take dusting, we use the same glass that this is, it's a, du it's a powder of okay. glass. And we powder over the, the, the template and we lift off the template and it leaves this pattern on our steel plate. Okay. And then we can roll that over and pick that up. But I make my own templates okay. as well to create the, the background. Like here's a really cool little circle. Right. Well, you imagine trying to do that by hand. You couldn't do it. You, you know, your dust would get all everywhere. But laying the template there and then powdering over it, and then gently lifting that off, then we roll the glass over it and we pick that up, and that's how we get our images into the uh, into the glass that way. Beautiful. And on the uh, lip of this, is this this is cane? Yeah, this is later, which is a European type of unique cane. This takes uh, I use well, I used Ben Moore Studio in in Seattle, and uh, we takes it takes about six guys to work to do one piece. We got six guys working with me. So we're, and we're doing some larger things and we'll be showing in New York in, uh, in September coming Excellent. up. Excellent, so. and we're at in New York? At the American Craft Museum. Oh yes, very we'll familiar. There. That's oh, yeah. gorgeous, gorgeous so we'll place. It's called yes. uh, Art and Design. Yes. It's the new title. Okay. So we'll be there in September. Yes, yeah. bought my wife a couple of pieces from Oh yeah, oh, yes. oh, yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, artists always collect. Oh yeah, we collect. <laughs> we, we do. We do that. We do that. You brought up the annealing process, and uh, yes. uh, most people don't know that glass goes from a solid to a liquid state. Right. And in that transition, it must uh, become stabilized. Can right. you explain that a little bit? Well, stabilizing the glass in the sense that w that it's an interesting uh, chemistry because you you can't let it get too as we bring it out of the. Glory Hall, we're keeping it, we have to keep it fluid in the sense that if it cools too quickly, it'll crack. Correct. So we, we, have, we have to know the, the time and the, and the amount of glass that you're using and how thick it is. So we have to measure that. Essentially, uh, as it cools down uh, to a point where we can take it off the punty and, and place it into the annealer, and essentially on the, it depends on the thickness of the glass. These are quite large, they'll, but they'll, it'll be probably staying two days in the annealer as it cools down. Some of them are in there for, you know, 900, four or five or 100 degrees, and it, it, there's, it's on a computer that okay. gently and slowly keeps, cools. Keeps cools. Right. This is this is much more forgiving than than the very thick glass. You can't. That's got to be in there for 72 to 80 hours because it's so thick. It's still hot in there. And to push that glass and bring it out, that's where the cracking has on the very thick castings. Right. Blowing glass is, you know, there's there's room for that, but it, it's it's it only takes a couple of days. But the castings is a much more uh, difficult, uh, you know, just leave it in there and let it go slower. And fusing's different too. Correct. We take it up to 14 and 80, 1480 degrees, and uh, or 12, and each each of these glass. This is, uh, now glass, not all glass are fusible because it's a different type of chemistry, but this is made by bullseye glass in Portland, Oregon, and it's, it's called fusible. This is made for fusing. fusing. So you buy, you have to have fusible glass. Correct. And then, but the chemistry of each color is different. Different. So this, this is uh, softer, harder, uh, medium, and so they're all at different, different uh, they melt at different temperatures. So I'm not the chemist, but the, the people that are fusing understand where they could go up and capture it, the, 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 that, that glass, whatever the one it takes the most to, to get hot, and then how fast they want to drop it down. So what happens if they don't do that, you'll get, the bubbles are not, uh, the bubbles are, are, we always get the bubbles because that's just air within that. It's not a, uh, you know, it's not airtight or Correct. what you call it. 
not in a vacuum. And it's not in a vacuum, correct. And that's fine. We, we, you know, bubbles are neat. Yes. But if you heat it too long, then it mushes. Right. See, they'll start to spread. The colors will start spreading into each other. And then you won't get the fine, crisp lines. And that's a real that, technique that's that you really got to learn. Because right in here, these two, they're going to start getting too hot. And then, bam, right. there they go. Right. And you don't want that. Exactly. And then, so that's, 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 a, that's what I have. I, I put all my faith in my fusers. And they've been right. doing it for years. Yeah, it looks that way because yeah. they're very good. Yes. They're, and they're dropping the temperature from about 1,200 degrees to about 800 in the annealing process over that 80-hour period. Is that approximately right? They drop it down to, you mean down to eight? No, they drop it down to room temperature. Oh, throughout the entire. Well, they process? just slow. I don't. I couldn't tell you. Okay. But it runs from 12, 14 to twelve, and then it's, and right. then they'll vent. There's ways of venting that slightly. They'll open up, but there's some fusers of uh, uh, tables that they'll circulate hot air in there as they're cooling it down. So it, that helps too to cool it. Excellent. But they'll bring it down. They'll leave it, and they'll crack it a little bit for another day or two. Right. You know, and then let it let it gently cool out. But it you could, it'll be a little warm still. You know? Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's a little warm. And yeah. um, you said you had your own kilns uh, for doing your fusions. Uh, Portland does. Portland. Okay. Studio Ramp has the, has the own kilns. Okay. Yeah. And they're about eight to ten feet. Oh, those are yeah, those are those are those are yeah. Uh, your frame, you make your own frame? Yeah, we, we cut our own frame. This is all water jet cut. Okay. So we cut, custom cut all the frames because they're so precise. They fit a half an inch around. So we make them so they're absolutely cut precision-wise. So you couldn't, I mean, to frame it and to do it by hand would be impossible to get the exact. You know, you could do it, but the amount of money oh. that you put into it Right. To manufacture it, uh, you know, by hand would be difficult. Well, we can actually computerize it, and our machine will cut through two inches of steel. So this is not difficult. It's slow, but we can cut our own steel frames. How long does it and take to cut one of these steel pieces? It'll take. It takes uh, this one probably one two. Probably uh, it's a lot of. You, you got to remember it's going to go all the way Right. Say. It took. Maybe it took a couple hours to cut it. Excellent. And it's out of one piece of steel. Too. One piece of steel. And then these are. And the these are clamps. We right. cut those, and we want to cut those too. And there's rubber. And then we use rubber mounts. Right. Yeah. Uh, and are these free floating or are they? Uh, yeah. We glue these in, but we'll float. This is this is floating in here. We can take. Right. We can uh, we can assemble this. We had it in Sofa, Chicago. Yeah, and we've had it in shows. And uh, this won the Allen Hauser Award in, uh, at the Hearth Museum two years ago. Correct. So it was quite a yeah. It was quite an honor because uh, we brought it from the south. I mean, from the north to the southwest. Correct. And to win the, the sculpture award is quite a oh, an honor in a sense because they're traditionally, you know, stone sculptors. Right. And, right. and then they're here to see this big northern style piece come out. It's very unusual. <laughs> Glass. Yes. And I was about not. I says I don't think I'll show it. And all of a sudden, I just went, "Wow, that is nice." So we we really enjoyed that. We like to do. We do two shows a year. We do the Santa Fe Indian Art Market. And we do the the uh, the Herd Museum show. Excellent. And uh, but uh, yeah. And how do you transport your works? Uh, we we have there? custom crates. Okay. We have have them custom made. Excellent. So everything is, you know, all the glass and everything is in their separate uh, containers. And then you yeah. reassemble it. And it Here we bring them up on the barge. Okay. Yeah, we ship them up on the barge, which is which is you know they're handled once, but we everything is we create everything when we ship them. And when you uh, go to the different shows that you participate in, uh, do you do the shipping? As I well? do it. I yeah, we do the shipping and we do the assemblies and everything. Yeah. Uh, so that's that. so it's on both ends. Then. Both ends. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Both yeah. ends. Yeah. Yeah. These are very nice. Yeah. Um, can you talk talk about these bowls? Over well, here? these are south. You know, these are interesting because we made these. Um, these are this is a beautiful one. This is yes. a, this one is a southwest uh, as a southwest pot, and we took it. To, we took it a few to Santa Fe, and it was just taking this idea of doing uh, the pots, but using the 
idea of, of uh, putting the ravens on them. And this is uh, unusual. That's it's not unusual in a sense, but you know, this is, a di this is uh, transparent and this is opaque. And how to do this is that we have to make three different bubbles. So we, we take the bubbles and a como, meaning that we have to cut these and then we reassemble them as we're blowing the glass. So you get transparent in the center, opaque on the, on the top, and an opaque at the bottom. Beautiful. And then, then, we'll, then we'll apply the, apply the ravens on it. But it was another kind of a uh, shape and form that I wanted to incorporate into my glass in the sense that my mother's from a sled or from New Mexico. Mm -hmm. And so it was fun to take some of the pots down to down there. Those are beautiful. Those are absolutely lovely. For the show. And this piece over here, was this one slung? Yeah, now this one was, we can take a piece of glass, and this here you can see again is uh, all water jet and then reassembled. You can see, you can actually see, right. you can actually see, see the, the glass and how it's, you know. And then, then we take a ceramic uh, mold and we can heat that up and then after it's fears and then we can slump it over. And, that, and this is one of my kind of signature pieces in the sense it's the salmon egg. Oh, okay. that I use quite often on, on my designs. Gorgeous. And I saw in the front that you also have a bronze work. Bronze work. This is the raven that I, we're doing uh, a number of ravens that I've used for, uh, these are actually mixed media in the sense that, uh, this is really a neat raven here. Yes, it is. That I've used, I've used in different sculptures. We've had a large glass piece that had uh, salmon berries as a bronze salmon berries going around this sculpture and then the raven just picked one off the vine. So he went with another sculpture but people loved him so much so we made an addition of him. And, and I work with an artist, uh, Nano, out of Walla Walla that will uh, uh, collaborate together to create the, the raven so I'll take photographs and this is actually, he's never done a raven before. So this is kind of a, a new thing for both of us, but he's a model maker. Okay. So we take that and take all the photographs and get as many images of ravens as we can, and then we create the, the piece. And I wanted him to kind of give you that look to this side. Right. And I wanted to give him a rave, a berry, and I wanted him to be freestanding like this. And then we use him with other sculptures. But we're doing two other ravens, and then we're this in the next few weeks we're having a large eagle coming in. That's oh, very fun. nice. That's going nice. to wear a chokat blanket. That's going to be woven by uh, a gal that works here. Oh, excellent. So that'll be excellent. probably for next summer. But, okay. but we're, we like to use them as, you know, part of the sculptures, using and mixing them in with other pieces. So that was the idea. And the fun thing is uh, right now the salmon berries are just... Be the salmon uh, berries are just, just, coming, just coming in. Yeah. Some of them are, are gone, but yeah, and there's yeah. those little salmon berries. Yeah, that's excellent. And how many of an addition are you This doing? is 50. 50? Yeah. Uh -huh. And uh, what foundry are you using? I use Blue Mountain Foundry in, in Walla Walla. Well, actually, Blue Mountain now is in Baker City. Okay. But we use, but near Walla Walla. And is this uh, uh, silicone bronze that you're using? We use we use silicon bronze. We use a gloss wax process. Okay. And some sand castings, but uh, we we use wax for this. We start with a clay form first. Correct. And then from there we can make our waxes. All right, and then cast it in silicon bronze, yeah. And uh, of course you make the mold off of your uh, clay. Off the clay, right. exactly. And this is actually in one, two, three, four sections of head separate. We have to weld this all on. Correct. And, do the, the and that's a, a gorgeous patina. Uh, yeah. It's, it's really beautiful. Nice. Yes. Yeah, yeah they're, 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 they're very Are they good using a, a liver of sulfur? Yeah, uh-huh. Beautiful, mm -hmm. beautiful. beautiful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I love the detail and I love the textures and, and I also like the artistic interpretations of Well that's that. what I like about what we were wanting. I wanted it very painterly. I don't right. want anything like a very I'm not really into Southwest I mean not Southwest, but more of the Western look. I wanted something more painterly, like I put right. my fingers on it. We run our fingers. Yeah, and I like the way you uh hold your sculptures and caress them, yeah, you know, yeah. uh, coming from Chicago, you know, you go to the museum, <laughs> you got to keep your hands in your pockets, yeah, right. even if you are a sculptor and you want to touch something, so it makes it totally different. And I, even in my sculptures, I want people to touch them. Oh, yeah. yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's 
imperative. We're, we're doing one for Children's Hospital in Tacoma that's a touchable piece of art. Now. Oh, excellent. That has a raven with it. Does it? Well, the kids can play a larger raven. And it's, it, but it'll be bolted down, but they can touch the raven. Good. Feel them, you know. Good. So Good. we're doing, yeah, touchable art's very important. Yeah, it is. Yeah. It is. Yeah. This beautiful work. Yeah. Um, the tapestry or the, yeah? If these are, yeah, we're taking, it's just taking the, the prints to another level in the sense that I was approached by Pendleton, Northwest Pendleton, which is, who does uh, Pendleton blankets. Correct. And this, this one here, it actually isn't the first one, but I was the first one to do a Northwest image in, in a, a Pendleton blanket, a salmon blanket. And this is just taking the print. As you can see, this is this, is this print here. Correct. Is in the blanket here. And uh, this has the, the patch. Uh -huh. And these are exclusive to the gallery. These aren't, Pendleton doesn't market these. Oh, okay. So they're, they're, they're quite exclusive. Northwest Pendleton store, which is not affiliated with Pendleton as a, owned by Pendleton, ha also has a blanket. But we collaborated together, which we created the, the wonderful blankets. But they, they turned out really well. Oh, they're, they're gorgeous. And, uh, they're absolutely beautiful. Uh, what was that about the Pendleton? Oh, I, this, this was, uh, is a unique, uh, you know, you take something like working in glass, there's certain limitations, and in silkscreen there's limitations, of course. Everything has a little bit of limitations to it, but not realizing when you do a Pendleton blanket, there's limitations, and the limitation is, I don't know if you don't, would know this, but the limitation is, what you're looking at is two colors only on a horizontal line. See? Only two colors. That's the way the weave is, but it doesn't look like that, does no, it? See? No. That's more, you know? But that, you only see two colors. That's see? amazing. So you can't, because that's the way the, the, the loom weaves. Okay. So whatever color, it's one plus one, one plus one. So I can only have blue and red. So if you call it, it's all across. This is not, this is not blue, red, and green. This is above this here. So Correct. So any of these, you go across, it's only two colors. And that was something that I, I went to Pendleton. I met with Pendleton Mills in Portland, Oregon, because I was working with the designer. And I, he says, design the blanket, bring it down. So I did it. But then all of a sudden, the, it was they redesigned. Didn't go, wow, you can't do that. <laughs> it was redesigned. See, you go, well, you got, two, you got more than two colors. Well, I didn't know that. Right. Either did Chuck, who was commissioning me to do the blanket, did okay. it. And the owner of Pendleton loved it so much, he goes, oh, that's beautiful. And uh, he didn't realize that he had to go. <laughs> that's excellent. But like all the native, when you look at Pendleton blankets, right. they're only two colors. But they look like they're just... Oh, they look like they have dozens. Yeah, right. and right. it's not. And they have a four-color loom that you can do four colors, but it's peppery. It's got a peppery... Uh, texture, texture. Fancy, you right? know, it's not quite as, as as rich and strong as the two color looms. So you, you, they do have a four color, but it's not used that often. Mm -hmm. But so that was a challenge. It, it looks and like it really it. was a challenge. But we did four blankets. We did this. Actually, is the salmon blanket here. It has the salmon coat. We did. We've done apparel, and this has been a very popular pattern. That's, that's beautiful. Too. And again, this is. Two colors coming across. Back in this, it looks like more colors here, but it's only two. Mm -hmm. And this was the first blanket. Was the salmon. Blanket. And then who does the uh, seamstress? Ah, uh, the a, a, a lady in Santa Fe, right? Yeah, in Santa Fe, New Mexico, does the does the. Uh, and I love the addition of the. And it has the buffalo uh, nickels. nickels. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's that's great. Yeah. That's wonderful. Um, can you tell us about some of your major commissions that you have? I see you have a portfolio book. Yeah. Sure. We can set this over. These are. Uh, actually, if I reading this. This is a. Uh, this is. These are some of my commissions I've done for different uh, um, parks and schools and 
This is a very large, it's one of the largest cast bronze pieces in the country. It's 30 feet high. That is incredible. And it's uh, Thunderbirds and, and salmon swimming. And, and uh, this, is the, this is the structure here. This is Correct. on site. And we're doing one similar to this that will go to Perugia, Italy. So when they put this in, they had to put the concrete pad on That's right, first. put the concrete pad and, and it's bolted on. Right, and they had we the think, bolts already in the uh, concrete so that it would deset. Yep. And then just uh, and then bolt it in. Bolt it in. So we had a template made that would fit this, and then we bolt it down. This is I like fins. I do a lot of fins. It's kind of a it's kind of a um, a canvas for me in bronze. And this is Correct. the eagle, and this Beautiful. is the raven, and, these are, again. and this is uh, Mark Anderson's work that we use out of Walla Walla. Uh, actually, uh, Tyler, who did the raven, patinaed this one too. And this is in the collection at the Portland Art Museum for their Northwest collection. It's been traveling extensively. It's been in New York for a show, as well as at the Peabody Museum in, in, in Now Salem. your interim And base. that's bronze, too. Oh, OK. Mm -hmm. All right. Make a bronze mold. Yeah. The Excellent. Polish it up. Excellent. And that's about eight feet high. That's gorgeous. And these are other fins that I've done. This is 10 or 12 feet high, and the kids can climb on it. That's a park no. in Seattle. This is more of a Salish motif. With cast glass, I'm incorporating glass in the sculpture uh, to just give it another effect, another. And how does it weather? It weathers extremely well. Now, bronze weathers nicely if you you can you can. Uh, what we do is that we when we heat the bronze up, we can take Johnson paste wax, and that Johnson's wax is really a good wax to use. It it penetrates the uh, bronze is porous, and when we heat it up, it'll penetrate the. The, the material and then we can polish it out but it's the but the but the the wax is inside the bronze now so oh. as a heat as it heats up if it's hot day you can go and polish it oh excellent and how and long does the uh, treatment last or it'll last f forever if you if you yeah. polish it and keep it and you what know, temperature just, do you apply the Johnson wax oh you can to? just warm just warm Not very hot no. okay and this is cast glass this is one of my first windows it's actually incorporated into a building inside a uh, and is this uh, a came in between? This or? is actually silicone. We silicone these. Each one is a separate tile here. Okay. And we silicone these parts. We sand cast these. Oh, all these right. These are individual sand cast. I took this image here and I made another one and cut it up and then made that into a casting. These are petroglyphs. These are sand castings I've done for you. Other yeah, one of my friends is an archaeologist in Wyoming, and so we, this, we, we go and see the petroglyphs thing. all the time. It's just a beautiful thing. And these are, you know, I use this experiment. I want to see what glass does, and this is actually a cast of iron, little figures we drop in. This is blown glass. This is a glass helmet. How did you uh, make the helmet? I carved it out of wood, Correct. and I made a two-part mold in bronze, and we just stuck the bubble in there and blew real hard. That the bronze and how many, the mold how many, that you saw is over at Diane's. It was okay. a one. And uh, how many times uh, did it take you to get we your first piece? We got about one out of four. We okay. got one. This is a beautiful. This is oh, 18, that's gorgeous. Eighteen feet long. It's a new school in, in Washington, with paddles. And <laughs> this is all cast glass with a steel frame, and it's it's your trans, It's your journey through education and inside and outside this environment. You know, here's a books that are. Uh, you know, it has uh, uh, comic books. There's live Life magazine, time. Right. <laughs> so it's 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 reading outside the your traditional classroom because you go to a barber shop, pick up a comic book. Exactly. And read it. Don't you don't have to. It doesn't have to be a textbook. You can learn something from just picking up a book, anything, a magazine, Correct. and a lot of other industrial things that you can you can do. And this is pretty interesting. This shows like you that actually this is a sand casting. Right. Of this little face, and we actually press and you can see the heat here. Correct. And then out, we can pop these little faces out. But that's a and that's a special type of glass as that's well. That's a spe Yeah, yeah, for casting glass. Exactly. Is, are you using We're a using uh, spruce pine for casting too? Okay. And uh, the the glass itself, are you using a lead crystal or? It's kind of a lead crystal. It's it's clear now. Pilchuck, as we all know, is a famous glass place but they use they, traditionally the old days they use bottle right. glasses green right you're right <laughs> but, but, we, but when you cast with it, it turns green but when you're blowing with it, it doesn't matter okay it's clear to see and this is showing you how hot those faces oh yes are. Oh, this yeah. is iron and we're ladling into iron this is the same face 
that tight. But we went from iron to graphite because iron got so hot. And they got, we, and this is a, a different, different, uh, different piece there. But this shows you some of the larger, this is up in Fairbanks, Alaska, another big face. And this is all water jet uh, aluminum and then powder coated and then incorporated glass. You can see the, the glass, the casting, the fusing, and the different applications of different types of glass onto the, and this is the Aurora Borealis with the Raven. And where is your studio located? It's in Seattle, Washington. Yeah, in our home. In your home? Right now. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's getting, we're building a new one. So okay, we're okay. Running out, we're running out of space. I would imagine so. And this is a more steel, water cut. And uh, where's this? This located? is at Carnation High School in, uh, near, uh, in Seattle, or near, uh, in Washington. Okay. And this is windows, fused and applicated. This is a beautiful piece here. I like one of my favorite pieces. I want to bring one in here. This is called Inner Balance, and this is a steel uh, piece, almost uh, uh, very modern in the sense of, of the, just the two colors. But you walk through it and around it, and as you walk around it, it changes, see, it cancels each other out. It's called right. Inner Balance, but these are the two shapes, the U and the ovoid. Okay. You see, this is what makes up all the art. Correct. So to surround you by, the, by these forms, it feels good, you know. You stand in there and just feel it. And what type of uh, paint did you this use? Is, this is, this is uh, powder coated. Okay. We do a lot of powder coating on, onto steel. And, and this was it, actually my first piece. It's low maintenance then. Yeah, very low maintenance. And this is actually my first steel piece. It was done quite a few years ago. And we uh, laser cut that one. And this is uh, a piece that's in a private home now. And this is all... Uh, fused glass again it's eight feet it's a right. large dorsal fin and, and there's a raven inside here and this was in the Lewis and Clark exhibit that traveled back east to Philadelphia and we were in that show uh, smaller face there these are doors that are at the these are actually at the uh, American Museum the American Indian in Washington DC now as okay. part of their permit collection wonderful and uh, <coughs> there's cast glass yeah, they just acquired these doors a couple months ago. And you can see, there's the green glass. That's right. Where, this was cast up at Pilchuck. And we, we were hoping to get more. And this I is, like it. Is this one of the wooden there's forms? There's a carved form, yeah. Right. We carved that out of wood. Basswood. Right. That's basswood. Beautiful. These are large walls. Castings of bronze. Steel, more oh, steel yes. with ravens. And these ravens move in the wind. Oh, they do? Yeah. See, he'll flip around. And this is way up in Fairbanks. And is this uh, an aluminum these, post? It's an aluminum post. See, these are, this is for an elementary school of grades, first, second, third graders. Mm -hmm. So you got the primary colors. Exactly. And primary shapes. See, there's a rectangle, square, triangle. And there's a chalkboard on the other side. And oh, how nice. Wind moves it. And there's a color, there's a color wheel. Uh huh. So they learn about color, shape, and form. Excellent. And Excellent. This is down at Neutrogena, down in New Mexico. It's at the Folk Life Museum. They purchased those for their entry. There's another door. This is the piece that was in the back room. That we, that we, this is, see, I carved that out of that right. foam. And then we cast it in the This is Issaquah Civic, Civic Center. And is this, are these bronze? Bronze, yeah, bronze eggs, salmon. Right. And this is Tokushima, Japan. Did some polls for them. This is the National Museum for Wildlife Art in Jackson, Wyoming. Oh, oh yes, the, oh yes. That's the pole. That's gorgeous. It's very elaborate. There's glass, cast glass, bronze, uh, copper, and all the shapes and forms that are around that area. Indian paint is Wyoming State right. flower. Right. Right. We brought in sage and frogs and bears and really brought in a lot of the animals and shapes and forms that, that's accustomed to that area. Right. The indigenous. Uh, indigenous artwork. to yeah. that exactly. This is at South Peter Sound Community College in their science building. Nice uh, patina. And, and these bronzes. are the bronze. Yes. So we just took them a little bit further. Instead of having a flat panel, we want to try it on a curved panel. It looks like the uh, patina on there it has a mottled texture to it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very nice. And this is copper, hammered copper. This is at North Seattle Community College. Another piece. This is, these are models that we do, a lot of models, and we'll cast them in bronze. And these models are made out of the oil-based clay, or are you making them out no, of No, I carve this out of wood. Out of wood. Mm -hmm. And then this is a big, 
This is in Minnesota. It's a well, that looks like Minnesota. Minnesota. Yeah, that's Minnesota. <laughs> yeah, it should go in there. They should have it now. And this is a, these are salmon that are swimming through kelp. And that's kind of right in there. These are just masks. I, mask. I don't do many masks anymore. I, I uh, we'll, we'll do some more sometime. But you know, they're kind of the octopus and stuff like that. But that's just a small. That's a wonderful. Small, ver, it's, small, it's, small thing that we do. It's beautiful. Um, now you know. I wonder. Did she give you? Bridget, do you have a, a resume? Uh, yeah. Current one. Yeah, we'll give you one. That just has all of Excellent. Uh, Stuff on there. I, since I'm a college professor and so are you, yeah. uh, a lot of our colleagues want students just to um, get more focused in one media. What is your opinion on that? Oh, I I disagree that wholeheartedly. Because it's, it's really... Um, Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank no, you. I, well, they're, they're, they're very traditional in their own sense, but it's really, it's up into your imagination. I think it's, there's so much, I write a lot, I do a lot of things that, you know, I like music and I think just the idea of, like I, I, I'm still trying to, you know, my, my uh, uh, creativity comes from just very emotional, you know, the emotional part of, you know, the color and Correct. the drama. But how do you take that into video? You know, how do you take right. that into, into music? What's the science behind getting all this into that? So that's a that's a challenge. I want to try to take it even further. See, taking that, but see, I've got the foundation. Right. I have that. That's underlining. But what you teach the students are the tools for creative, that creative process. Teach them the tools. Teach them how to be, uh, to, to investigate. You know. Right. Well, regardless of whether they're do your jewelers, research. do your research, and 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 take the best and leave the rest. I mean, you, but you're never going to be. I'm a student of the arts today. And if I, I fell in that old school too, I was a painter and litho, but but I still use those. But I learned a lot from my old, some of my older professors too. But but you you don't know what what that there, you know there's no there's no pinnacle to being an artist. Correct. You know there's no there's no mountain. It's it's an upward road. Now you're gonna come down a few times. Yeah, yeah. But and I tell my students, you never you're yeah. never a failure. Right. You learn from your mistakes. You th that's you know, I, you I never try, fail. I try you've to, made some mistakes. Correct them, but right. don't. But take those that you've made, and you know. And if you, you know, it's oh, this is terrible. This is okay. Well, let's look at it. Okay, let's throw that out, and then just you know, and then just work on that other thing. Right. And then if you're not comfortable working on something that you, then let's leave that alone. Do you know? Work on what you like. Go and you know. And then, you know, you you can't help if they're honest with themselves. They can't help but go out there and investigate and be a, be as creative, but they can't be limited by saying, well, you've got to do it this way, you've got to Correct. do that, see? Because that really hinders them, because I, well, gee, I can't do it that way. Well, you can, see? But it might not be a year from now, it might be 10 years, it could be 20 years, and all of a sudden, boom, it hits them right in the head. Right. There it is. That's, I found something, you know? And so our students, they're, they're it's, it, we don't graduate with a degree to get a job. I mean, it's no. an ongoing process, Correct. and I'm just on the very on the on the and very fringe, but yet we all have something to contribute. And we all you evolve. See, we all evolve. It's an evolution. It's a right. constant evolution, and uh, I'm a firm believer that you got to you know keep an open mind and just keep looking at things. And just and I'm, that's the way I approach it. And the students have done very. My students have done. Extremely well, I'm keeping that kind of. Yeah, I, I just you interviewed know, one of your students. See? So uh, well, there, yeah, and there's a number of them, and, and they're they're that must they're make happy. You feel very proud. Yeah, I am very proud of my students. I've done extremely well, and and I and, and uh, you see them out there, and, and they're uh, and they're, and they're experimenting, the and they're show. Oh yeah, and they're, <laughs> they're going to be, um, you know, really successful. Oh uh, yes. Comes up. but uh, but being an artist and being a well, the professor part. That's a luxury in the sense I enjoy working with students, and I'm Correct. really, you know, that's just really, really, a, a, it allows me to, to share what I've learned, giving them that incentive, but yet, I always tell them, you know, there's a surprise around every corner, and you don't know when that's going to happen, but it's there, exactly. and it happens all the time. Exactly. So you've got to be just, you know, gee, I'm just not getting things done, it's like, just, hey, it'll happen, you know, if you're real honest with yourself, you know, and you give 100%, 
you know, you're going to be successful. Right. I, I learned from a guy who's a, quite a famous painter. And you know, Mar he said, Marvin, you know, whatever you make, everything will sell. I mean, it's kind of like, meaning that everything you put your heart into it will be successful. And, exactly. and I'm telling you, it's proven it's up true. to this point. It's true. It's always been a proven, you know, they say, well, gee, that's never going to sell. Well, you don't, you don't look at art as being something that's marketable. Correct. If you, you know, then you're going to be... You know, doing right. stuff. You know, you, you have to be honest and do right. what you feel is really your thing. Comes from your heart. That's right. And man, you just got to let it go. Yes. And that's why I, I do what I do. And that's why this gallery is successful in my heart. Is that it, it allows other people to come in, look at the work, and see and inspire them. Exactly. You see, and if I, you know, and the diversity and, too. And the diversity and inspiration, and that helps them a lot. You sense that I want to do it. Well, you know, you're just limited. And that's why, you know, it's a big investment, but the investment is always a good return. Yes. The people that come in and see it. And, you, and it was something that I've always wanted to do, was have a place where I could bring in larger work where, you know, right. you can't do that down there. Exactly. You know, but that's, exactly. that's a quaint place for, the, uh, that's the marketable, that's, you know, that's, right. that's the, maybe the tourist part of us. Correct. You know, the marketable part, but yet here, this is also something that really is important to us. So. Yeah, I, I get a lot of questions from my students and from uh, people who collect art, and they say, what's your favorite medium? And I can't answer that. Well, I don't have a favorite, really. I don't, I, when, I, when I'm printing, which I, I really enjoy printing, and I do all my own prints, I can't, you know, I say, well, gee, that's a lot of work. Yeah, set that up. I said, well, I can't, because I can't, I mix my own colors. And I gotta, I gotta register each one. You right. know, if there was another way, well, maybe. But no, it's exhausting work. But I, you know, I, I get satisfaction out of that. But, uh, but when you're working with now, when I'm doing things like prints, and that's really very personal in the sense. It's just all my. It's just all me. That's my exactly. But when I do glass, like the blowing and stuff, this is six guys. And it's, see, I know how that's going to turn out. I can tell you exactly how that's going to turn out. Whereas this, this is therapy. Because you, you don't know how it's going to turn out. Exactly. And you put all your, your energy and soul in these five other guys. Exactly. And so, trust. And trust, see. So you get something, you get a reward by these people giving their 100%. And they love working with, I mean, these guys are the best. Uh, they are darn best craftsmen. I, I wish I could. Uh, glass blowers and. Let me show you something. If you okay. got a minute? Oh yes, sure. Let me see. Let me do. Let me at the back because I was playing with something. All right, I was going to show that to you, but I'll send it to you. Okay. That's one run off the, the spirit canoe ceremony would take place, and this was their journey to the land of the dead, and they were retrieving one man's one person's lost soul because he was sick. So this is their journey. These boards and everything would take them because they couldn't see their way. So these were their helpers. So I want to do them in glass. Oh, how nice. So we originally started doing them in glass and we would have the spirit figures in the glass and all the powder in there and all that stuff. And I, we're doing them by hand, which means we'd blow them like that and we'd stretch them out and we'd hang them and we'd start manipulating the glass, but they were too, they weren't getting long enough, but as, as gravity pulled down, they got too narrow. Uh -huh. So They're beautiful, but right. they just weren't one of... So we know a mold maker, which makes wooden molds out of cherry wood, and he would, he's a very famous mold maker for Dale Chihuly and some of the other, Billy Morris's work. And he makes it, and I says, okay, I went out to Yosef, and I says, Yosef, I want a mold made. It has to be this big, this wide, four inches, and it has to take this shape, and then we're gonna drop the glasses, there's no problem, you know, we'll make it. So that you, you spent you know, hours on making this mold. And it's and so we could clamp it together, and then these guys made this huge bubble of glass after we picked up all the imagery and all that, and then we, they let it go into the mold and let it get down into that cavity and blew really hard. Uh -huh. And then it was vents, and this thing was on fire and everything, <laughs> and it was all smoking. And then, then you see him pop it out, and here comes this beautiful spirit board.
Ooh.